Okay, um, water reabsorption is the most complicated one. It, it's not as bad as it initially looks because it's just three different steps of water reabsorption. Um, it, it moves by osmosis in all three of the steps. So basically I moved all of these solutes and then water is going to passively follow as long as it can follow. So basically there are going to be three places that you move water. The first step is um, proximal convoluted tubule reabsorption of water, again by osmosis. All it's going to do is follow all of those solutes that you moved back in primarily sodium, but not exclusively sodium. Remember I told you guys at the beginning of um, the semester that solutes suck and sodium sucks the most. So remember I, at the proximal convoluted tubule, I reabsorbed 65% of the water, I'm sorry, that sodium that was pushed out. And 65% of the water that was pushed out follows it. So I do about 65% of my water reabsorption here by this mechanism, right? And the solute that I'm following is primarily sodium. This is non-regulated reabsorption of water. I can't do anything about it. I always reabsorb 65% of it. Then there is a second non-regulated step that works slightly differently. It is really hard to understand with the textbook pictures. I'm gonna show you this, but I've got a great video. This guy explains it better than I do. So I'm gonna let him do it. The second step is when it occurs at the loop, right? Um, remember that we are going to go proximal convoluted tubule and then we're going to go descending limb of the loop and ascending limb of the loop and then it's distal convoluted tubule. So what I want to look at is what happens here. This is the loop is almost always about water, well, it is always about water reabsorption. The longer the loop, the better the water reabsorption. Desert animals like kangaroo rats have really, really long loops of Henle. So um, the second reabsorption step is what we call the countercurrent multiplier. It sounds super hard the first time you go through it. It's not as bad as you think it is. Um, and what this does is dramatically increases the non-regulated water reabsorption. So I did 65% and now I'm about to do another 15% of non-regulated reabsorption at the loop via the countercurrent multiplier. So let's watch this video. It's only two and a half minutes. The countercurrent multiplier, also known as the countercurrent exchange system, is the method that the nephron uses to concentrate urine. For a lot of people, just the name of this process is daunting. Countercurrent multiplier sounds like a complicated math formula or something, but it's really much easier than it sounds. To begin with, let's look at the anatomy of the nephron and its place in the kidney. If you recall, the kidney is divided into the outer portion, the cortex, and the inner portion, the medulla. The glomerulus and proximal tubule are located in the outer cortex. The loop of Henle descends down into the medulla of the kidney, loops around, and comes back up. By the time it becomes the distal tubule, it's back in the cortex. The collecting ducts then descend back down into the medulla and eventually empty the filtrate into the calluses and renal pelvis. For starters, I want you to think of the medulla as being very salty. In fact, at the bottom of the loop of Henle, the sodium concentration is about 300 milliequivalents per liter, which is double that of the blood. The loop of Henle has some special characteristics that explain why that is, and it's really all about saving energy. So the descending loop of Henle is extremely permeable to water, but it's impermeable to ions. So water is able to passively diffuse out of the descending limb where it is reabsorbed by the vasa recta, the vessels that surround the loop of Henle. The ascending limb, especially the thick segment, however, is the opposite. It's impermeable to water, but will use energy to actively pump ions like sodium and chloride out of the tubule into the interstitium of the medulla. When it does this, it creates a hypertonic environment around it. Because the descending limb is very permeable to water, water leaves the descending tubule without expending any energy because it is following the concentration gradient. So it is called countercurrent because the filtrate flows in opposite directions, down the descending loop and back up the ascending loop. It is called a multiplier because the active pumping of ions out of the ascending tubule 
multiplies the amount of water that is reabsorbed from the descending tubule. As more water is pumped out, the filtrate becomes more and more concentrated. Okay, so you may need to watch that a couple of times, but I what I want to tell you is that basically I am taking sodium that wasn't reabsorbed here. Stop, stop, stop. I'm taking sodium that wasn't reabsorbed here. And I'm going to send it through the tube. But the um, descending um, is permeable to water and the ascending is not permeable to water. So what this one is going to do is to actively pump ions into this area which will make it super duper salty, which will pull the fluid out of um, the water in the descending out of the tube, and then it will move back into the bloodstream. And having them go at counter current um, ends up making it more effective that doing, doing that. So urine is basically concentrated by the loop of Henle. And like I said before, the longer the loop of Henle, the more urine concentration you will do, okay? And that um, video is linked right here if you want to actually watch it on your own. Okay, so the third reabsorption step is um, controllable. And it's primarily at the distal convoluted tubule, a little bit at the collecting duct, but let's just concentrate on the distal convoluted tubule. So um, this is up to 19% of um, your water can be reabsorbed at the distal convoluted tubule but only if there is the hormone that you learned before called ADH, antidiuretic hormone that's present. Um, so um, the cells of the distal convoluted tubule, and this is regulated reabsorption, um, uh, must contain ADH. Um, they are going to respond to ADH. Um, and ADH, remember, was released from the uh, posterior pituitary. It's made up in the hypothalamus and released from the posterior pituitary. And when ADH is present, you will do up to that 19% reabsorption there. So let's look at a couple of different situations. If ADH, let's talk about whether, a, if ADH was high, if the posterior pituitary had secreted ADH, then what's going to happen is you are going to reabsorb um, up to 19% of that water. And then that means you are not going to pee very much. Okay. ADH will also cause the thirst response. So it'll cause water reabsorption at the distal convoluted tubule, and it'll also cause the thirst response. But what about if ADH secretion is low? If ADH secretion is low, then water cannot pass through the DCT cell membranes because um, apparently ADH causes the aquaporins to go to the surface. Even if sodium was reabsorbed at the distal convoluted tubule, if ADH is not there, then water can't follow sodium. Okay, so water can't pass through the DCT cell membranes, even if sodium um, reabsorption is occurring, unless there is ADH. So what happens is if you don't have ADH, you secrete, uh, you excrete large quantities of dilute urine. That's called polyuria. And remember back from the endocrine chapters that there was another reason for polyuria that was not related to glucose, and that was um, Hyposecretion of ADH can cause that other form of diabetes, which is called diabetes insipidus. And there's a text box in this chapter about diabetes insipidus. Okay, so what causes um, ADH secretion? Just to bring this back to something that you learned before. ADH secretion is primarily determined by the water concentration or osmolarity of the bloodstream. So as the blood goes by, for instance, the hypothalamus, it is assessed, and if the water concentration is low, then like the blood plasma is hypertonic, then the posterior pituitary will secrete ADH and water will be reabsorbed. So basically, if there is not enough water in the bloodstream when it goes by the hypothalamus, then the posterior pituitary will secrete ADH, cause the kidney to reabsorb water. Wasn't enough water, give me some more water. Um, and vice versa also exists. So if the water concentration um, at the um, brain hypothalamus posterior pituitary was high, then it will inhibit ADH secretion and then you will not reabsorb the water at the distal convoluted tubule. Um, a couple other reasons that um, ADH might be secreted is that ADH can also be secreted if the blood volume or blood pressure was low. Okay. Um, not just water concentration, but also blood volume and blood pressure. 
Okay, so let's talk briefly about reabsorption of other stuffs, and then we will get into secretion, which is way easier. Um, so uh, well, let me review one more time. Um, water reabsorption, three-step water reabsorption, proximal convoluted tubule, non-regulated reabsorption of water, 65%, can't do a damn thing about it, just follows a solute in. Loop reabsorption, non-regulated, 15%. Um, primarily because you are actively pumping solutes into the extracellular fluid here, and then water is going to follow um, because this portion is really permeable to water. And then distal convoluted tubule reabsorption of water is where you can control it, and the controlling hormone there is ADH, okay? It's moving by osmosis the whole time though. Um, okay, um, reabsorption of other stuff. So what about lipid soluble stuff? Lipid soluble stuff does whatever it wants because it's lipid soluble. It can move straight down its concentration gradient wherever it wants. So although, yes, you might push things that are lipid soluble out by filtration, um, they'll get reabsorbed down their concentration gradients if they want to, and you really can't stop them. So fatty acids, drugs, toxins, lipid soluble poisons are really hard to clear from the body because the kidneys can't really do much with clearing them because they just move straight back in down their concentration gradients. Now, if you have a lipid soluble something that the liver can change up a little bit to make it less lipid soluble, more water soluble, then the liver and the kidneys can work together to clear it. Now, if a substance gets pushed out um, into the tube and it's not lipid soluble and doesn't have any reabsorption proteins, um, then typically it just stays there. If you filter it out, right, and it doesn't have any way to bring it back in, then it ends up staying there. So, or getting reabsorbed incompletely, um, just like tagging along with something else. So creatinine from creatine phosphate metabolism is not reabsorbed at all. Um, urea and uric acid, um, sometimes they're reabsorbed in completely. So basically, if you push it out and there isn't a reabsorption mechanism, it usually stays out there. Okay, um, so reabsorption is the hard part, but separate it into steps and you will be able to do it. Secretion is not as hard.